Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here. God stay so with me. Shalom. And in today's class, we're going to be talking about the timing of the end time events. Okay. A lot of people have been asking for the chronology of the events that we're looking for in these end times. Mm -hmm. So I brought Stacy in because when I mentioned it, you act like it was something that you were interested in. I am. Plus, you'll be able to ask the questions that other people will have. Okay. So if you guys would go ahead and hit the like button, be prepared to leave a comment and make sure you stay to the end because we're going to be covering a wealth of information, but the most important parts will be toward the end of the video. Okay. We're kind of going to have to build up to how it is that we understand this timing. So we're going to have to jump through a few verses before we get to Revelation chapter eight. So I ask you guys just bear with us for a minute as we pull out the verses that support these dates and stuff. I think the good thing about that is um, you always want to have scripture to back up exactly what you say, because you definitely will have someone to say, prove it. Yeah. And for that, guys, um, remind you that I am not a prophet. I am actually an engineer, mm -hmm. um, which means that I know how to do research and I know how to count. But you read the Bible before you went to engineering school. Yeah. So, yeah, that's right. Um, actually read it three complete times from cover to cover before I ever went to engineering school. So. A lot of what I learned down there with those scientists was backing up the scripture. Mm -hmm. But anyway, enough about me. In this video, we're going to be talking about the seven seals. We're going to be talking about the last jubilee. And you might even hear some hints about the rapture if you're interested in such things. You might actually be able to figure out. Like I say, you might get some hints on it. We're not going to talk about it directly. Okay. This video is brought to you by the Celestial Clock Calendar, the official timepiece of the 144,000. Get your Celestial Clock Calendar at coachinafight.shop or follow the links in the description below. Let's go ahead and get right into it. We're looking here at Revelation chapter 8, but like I said, we're going to come back around to it. It's going to be the main part in our study, but we want to build up some confidence and what I'm going to say about the timing of the events we see there in Revelation 8. You see how it's talking about the seventh seal there? Mm -hmm. Let's jump over to the third testament of the Bible that actually explains what the seven seals are. Okay. There's actually a whole chapter devoted to the seven seals. Right. Chapter 38 is about the three divine revelations and the seven seals. But we're going to be looking in the section called the seven seals of history again this is the third testament of the bible you guys can find a link to it in the description of this video but anyway we're going to come down here to verse 35 out of chapter 38 and we're not going to read all of these we're kind of just going to briefly talk about them you see right there where it's talking about the first phase or the first seal it says was opened with abel right and I'm sure a lot of people are surprised by this because we hear a lot of um, ministers talk about the seven seals. But for that, I'll remind you guys that this is the only scripture that tells us what the seven seals are. There's, okay. a, there's a lot of speculation. There's a lot of conjecture. A lot of people just flat out making stuff up when it comes to the seven seals. But when you read and listen to what they have to say, notice that they have no scripture to back it up. Okay. We actually have scripture now that we have the third testament of the Bible that explains them. And the first seal actually opened back there with Abel. All right. He was the first minister. Then the second seal was opened with Noah. Right. Mm -hmm. That's kind of when we read about the violence taking over the world. If you've watched that uh, very fictitious movie about Noah, you see it was kind of all about violence and people killing each other. Mm -hmm. That's kind of when that period started. It says that he is the symbol of faith. Absolutely. He built an ark right. on faith. Mm -hmm. You know, actually during the time of Noah, there had been no rain on the planet. Did you know that? I did not know that. Up until the time that the flood occurred, 
there had been no rain. In fact, the flood was the first time it had ever rained on the earth. Okay, makes sense. So now it makes sense why he was a symbol of faith is he was building a boat. Yeah. When there had been no rain. Right. Mm -hmm. Then we see that the third stage was with Jacob, the symbol of strength. Mm -hmm. He was the one who fought against the angel. Right. Mm -hmm. That would have been associated with the black horseman. Okay. Well, that's the time when they had to go into Egypt because of the famine and, and such. Mm -hmm. And you read about the scales in the book of Revelation and how they were selling bread for a penny and selling this and selling that. Well, it was during the time of Jacob was the first time that humans had to pay to eat. Right. Mm -hmm. Before then, of course, everybody grew their own food. But in Egypt was the first time man had to pay to eat. And today man is still the only species on the planet that has to pay to eat. Right. Mm hmm. Then the fourth seal was opened with Moses, we see there in verse 47, who represented the law. Yeah, I would say rightfully so. And then the fifth seal was with our Messiah. There we read in verse 48. It says that his symbol is love. Yeah. And we read how it was after his time that the persecution of the Jews really started. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Before then, they had really only been targeting the temples and such, burning down the buildings. Mm -hmm. But it was after the Messiah that they actually started killing the people and, you know, really trying to exterminate all signs of our Messiah, all signs of our father, no doubt, ever since. And yeah. During the reign of the kings, it was mostly about the kingdom and the kings and the things that they did. But. Right around the time of the Messiah is when they actually start um, trying to kill the people. Mm -hmm. And are still trying to do so today. But anyway, we have the sixth seal being opened with Elijah. And this brings us to this third testament of the Bible. What says that he is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, he's the symbol of the Holy Spirit. And this seal, this sixth seal was actually opened right before this third testament actually started coming down. We're going to talk more about that. But the last thing we'll talk about in this third testament is the seventh seal, which we'll see after the trumpets blow, after the vials and such. And that is the father himself, it that, says. Absolutely. That's when everything is wrapped up. That's when we will be in a new heaven and a new earth and under what we call the new covenant right under his rule that thousand year reign but like i said we're going to come back to the sixth seal because it kind of leads us to where we are today understanding that the sixth seal was opened like we said in the 1800s in actually 1883 to be specific okay the sign of his opening was the krakatoa event there which you may have heard about that volcano Mm -hmm. Especially if you watch many of our videos, mm -hmm. we did a whole video on Krakatoa in 1883 and how the significant events around Krakatoa fell on feast days. And almost all of it corresponds to what we read about in Revelation chapter 6. Mm -hmm. But like I said, we did an entire video on it yeah. proving that this was the sixth seal event that we read about. In Revelation chapter 6, you had the great earthquake, you had the sun going dark and not giving its light for a period of time. You had, you even had the stars falling from heaven um, that was witnessed by one of the people with the first telescopes you just happened to see a meteor shower during that time. So all of the events in Revelation chapter 6 related to the sixth seal, you can find it back there in that Krakatoa event which lets us know that we were close to the seventh seal being opened mm -hmm. so let's get into more information about when the seventh seal was opened okay now one of the places we'll look to understand it is in the epistle of the apostles where in verses 16 and 17 there's a dialogue between the apostles and our messiah as they're asking him when will these end time events take place mm -hmm. Like, for instance, how they talk about the sign of the cross there. Mm -hmm. This is related to what we saw in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 
3, where they're asking him about the signs of his coming. Mm -hmm. Then in verse 30, he talks about the sign of the Son of Man. Well, that's the sign of this cross that we see here in the epistle of the apostles in verse 16. Right. And then in verse 17, he tells them that this would actually take place in the 120th part or the 120th Jubilee. So our Messiah here gives us some timing. As to when the seventh seal will be open. Yeah, well, all of these end time events, when they're actually going to start kicking off here. Okay. To understand the 120th Jubilee, we have to come to the book of Jubilees and look down in verse four. We can see when the last scriptural Jubilee was. Mm -hmm. In other words, the last time a Jubilee was talked about in all of scripture is in verse four of the last chapter of the book of Jubilees. Okay. Jubilees chapter 50 tells us that the crossing of the river Jordan back there with Joshua, mm -hmm. back when the walls of Jericho fell, mm -hmm. that was a Jubilee year. It was actually the 50th Jubilee year. And like I said, this is the last time we hear about a Jubilee year in the Bible. So we can use this to figure out when the 120th Jubilee year was. Simply by doing a little bit of math, we understand that they crossed the River Jordan in the year 1456 BC. So if we step ahead 70 Jubilee cycles, we get to 1975 being the 120th Jubilee. Okay. 70 plus 50 is 120. So what we gather here is that the seventh seal opened in 1975. Okay. Which brings us back to Revelation chapter 8, which tells us that once the seventh seal was opened, we entered into a half hour of silence. Mm -hmm. And from there, we must go to the apocalypse of Abraham because that's where we learn how long a half hour is. And the apocalypse of Abraham down in chapter 28 and verse 5, we see that in the time that we live in, an hour is 100 years. Okay. So if an hour is 100 years, then a half hour is about 50 years, right. which is about a Jubilee cycle, Okay. Mm -hmm. which would be 49 years. So what that's telling us is from the time that the seventh seal opened in 1975, we have somewhere around 49 or 50 years until we see the sign of the cross or the sign of the son of man in the sky and so that would bring us to around 2024 or 2025 2024 is when we will have that x across america but that actually falls on the first day of the first month in the year 2024 which would imply a beginning and not necessarily an end but when we look over at this calendar that I've been putting together with the understanding of how these days in the end times corresponds to years in the end times, that puts the half hour of silence to end in the year 2025. You understand how this calendar works? I don't. I do not. Well, as you know, I've been tracking these dates since the late 90s. Mm -hmm. But it was made clear to me that these biblical dates like Haggai chapter 1 and verse 15 actually point to years that verse is talking about an earthquake and you can see the prophetic fulfillment of that earthquake back in about 2010 okay but anyway more importantly we saw the tetrad in the sky in 2014 and 2015 I remember that's when the tribes started waking up yeah mm -hmm. and started this seventh month cycle to start there in 2016. I know this is a little bit confusing for some that haven't followed this, but when we're thinking of a day to a year, 2016 was the first day of the seventh month, taking us to the year 2025 being atonement day. But that's something I've been working on on my own. Let's jump back over and look at some more scripture, particularly Gad the seer. Okay. Where down in chapter 14, we start hearing about this first day of the seventh month, mm -hmm. which is where I get a lot of the information for that calendar I just showed you. But anyway, what it's telling us here 
down in about verse seven is that we have these books that are opened. Three books. The book of the righteous, the book of the wicked, and the book of those who haven't decided yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we learn down in there that those people who haven't decided yet are actually given 10 years to decide. They're given what we know as the 10 days of awe right. or 10 years in order to learn to live within the law. And we are in that period of time now, right? This period, like we said, started in 2016, being the first year. Mm -hmm. And from there, we're given 10 years until the year 2024, 2025, which will be the prophetic fulfillment of Atonement Day. Right. And like I said, I remind you guys, I'm not doing this off of prophecy. This is all just calculations and just going off of what the Bible says. If you don't have the reference, if I'm saying something and I haven't presented a reference for it, just ask me and I'll give you in the comment section or I'll do a whole nother video. Like I said, I, that's why I wanted to bring Stacy in to kind of help fill in some of the blanks for people who haven't done this as many times as I have. But if you still left with any blanks, ask me in the comment section and I'll let you know. I'm not making any of this stuff up. You know, it's all based on what we read in the scripture. It's just a matter of pulling it out. I have a crazy question. So do you think that you have sometimes have more people who would rather have you to give out prophecy than for you to just come straight with scripture? Well, we live in the Piscean age now. This is the age where people prefer deception over truth. You know, Bible is boring. Truth is boring. That's why people prefer things that are fanciful. They prefer science fiction over science. Mm -hmm. You know, people, it's just the age that we live in. So absolutely, people prefer prophecy because a lot of times prophecy is just intuition mixed with their own thoughts. And because it's so much more exciting than the truth, people tend to go with that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why they watch soap operas more than they watch documentaries. Right. People prefer things that are made up. So absolutely, people prefer those who claim to be prophets and are hearing directly from our father because it just sounds so much better than, you know, biblical facts. Right. Like this one over here in Gad the Seer which is telling us that we have 10 years to get right. Mm -hmm. 10 years, like I said, to learn to live within the law, to learn the Sabbath days and the feast days. And what we're going to talk about here, activating the Elijah spirit, this is the time that we're in now. And, you know, those who are, you know, waiting for these end time events, trying to prophesy about these end time events, really need to take this into consideration because none of those events are going to take place before Jacob has his chance. Jacob has to be given his chance in order to be mm -hmm. converted over. Mm -hmm. You know, there's those who've been waiting since 2017 to get out of here. But like I told you in 2017, it's just too early right? Mm -hmm. because, you know, Jacob has to have his time in order to be converted over into Israel. And that time doesn't end until the year 2024 or 2025. Okay. Now, this is where a lot of people tend to get upset with me because they want me to always tell them, just like they want everybody else to tell them, that these end time events are going to take place today. Mm -hmm. They It kind of goes back with what you were asking about the prophecies. You know, a lot of those so-called prophets out there will tell them that they're going to get raptured away next month. Only to come back next month and say again. They're gonna get. Month. They're gonna do it. They do that every single time, and people prefer that. You know, people will get mad at me. I'm talking about 2024, 2025. Mm -hmm. They're gonna click off this video and then go find somebody that's gonna tell them that it's gonna be 2022. Mm -hmm. And then, like you said, they'll come back and tell them that it's gonna be 2023, and they'll keep doing that. The problem with that is what they're doing. They're actually fulfilling Satan's plan, which is to string people along. Making them just keep waiting and keep waiting and keep waiting until that 10 years are up. Mm -hmm. Thinking they have more time. 
no, thinking that they're going to get out of here any day now, mm -hmm. making them waste their time. Okay. Like I said, that's Satan's plan is because those who don't convert, those who don't get their names written in this book of life, Satan gets them as his reward. Yeah, it says, and Satan took the wicked to a wasteland to destroy them there. So all of the people who don't learn about feast days, don't learn about Sabbath days, don't learn about law, will actually be part of this group here that's going to get destroyed with Satan. So that's what they're doing when they keep stringing them along is just, like I said, making them waste their time mm -hmm. instead of teaching them the law, instead of teaching them what the Bible says. They just got them wasting their time so that when this time period is over, they will be turned over to Satan. Right. And like I said, that looks to me to be around this year, late 2024 or in the year 2025, when we'll start to see Satan's people go out into the wilderness, which brings us back to Revelation chapter eight. You see here in Revelation chapter eight, let me, matter of fact, let me let you go ahead and read some of this. If you will read verse one. Okay. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. So this is where we're at now. We're actually in this half hour of silence. Like we said, it started in 1975. Mm -hmm. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God. And to them were given seven trumpets. Now, notice that the seven trumpets haven't blown yet. Right. They are waiting uh, or still in, in a holding pattern before they actually blow anything. Okay. Back there in chapter seven, we saw that the 144,000 was sealed. And we even see them mingling with the multitude that no man can number down there in about verse 14. These will be the ones that will be standing on Mount Zion. In other words, these are the ones who got their names written in the book of life before these other events take place. Okay. That was in chapter seven. Again, that's the period we're in now. That's part of this silence that we're going through. This is what the third Testament is talking about when it's telling us to work in silence. This is the period that we're actually learning, learning what it is that we're supposed to be doing. This is pointing to this half hour of silence right you know in all your classes well a lot of your classes we talk about how the preparation must be done first how you just um it just doesn't come immediately there's always preparation absolutely that's why you want to wait till you get to the end so we can see what we we're supposed to be doing to prepare ourselves now but we'll get to that coming back over to revelation chapter 8 would you read verse 3 and another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Now, this right here is talking about the high priest and his actions on atonement day. Mm -hmm. This is when a time that he does all of these things here, talking about the golden censer, the incense and all of that. Even what we see in verse four, this is the prophetic fulfillment of atonement day. So is this uh, would be considered what the Messiah would do? Absolutely. He is our high priest now. And so that's why he's associated with these events like we read about over in the epistle of the apostles happening at the end of the 120th Jubilee. Mm -hmm. But we may come back to this verse because it gives more details on when we can actually look forward to these events. Well, let's look at verse four in chapter eight. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Again, this is all associated with atonement day. Matter of fact, we can see what atonement day would look like there in verse five. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. So we have this huge earthquake that's going to kick off these events. That's when the rest of the world will start to wake up and realize this is going on. And when, it's all told to us right here in scripture for us plainly to see. Absolutely. He's even talks about these voices here, which is associated with the conscious. Mm. Now we don't know much about the thunderings because they're kind of blocked out. We don't, he didn't uh, tell us exactly what the thunderings are. And then the lightnings could be pointing to, you know, the flash that's supposed to come across the sky with the sign of the son of man and such. Okay. But my main thing that I want you to understand is how this right here, which is the prophetic fulfillment of atonement day happens before 
these seven angels start to sound like we see there in verse six. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, go ahead and read that. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. So this is what we're looking forward to right here. This is your chronology right here. Like I said, we're in the half hour of silence. Mm -hmm. We're waiting for this high priest here to do these actions with the incense and with the golden censer, even casting this fire down to the earth that's going to create this earthquake and such. But it's after that that we start to see the trumpets start to blow, which go along with the vials being poured out on the earth. Right. So that's your chronology there. That's where we're at now. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can go through the the trumpets and the vials there, but we'll probably do that in another class. So what actually happens is the earthquake comes first. Yeah, that's the first thing we'll notice. Right. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on, like the, the half hour of silence, mm -hmm. the 144,000 and the multitude that no man can number are being sealed in their foreheads. There's a lot of stuff going on right now. Mm -hmm. The tribulation is going on. But a lot of people won't notice that stuff. Right. Because, you know, they the majority of the world, seven or eight billion people that's on the planet are too caught up into materialistic stuff mm -hmm. and are not paying attention to anything. So they won't notice anything until they see a material manifestation and that's going to come in the form of the of an earthquake right that's going to be their first notion mm -hmm. that any of this stuff is actually real or happening or anything is going on whatsoever is this earthquake i guess that's one of the reasons i know there are many that the father tells us that we should not you know be involved in materialism because you can't see this stuff going on right if you the important stuff is is not going seen yeah yeah so uh, they're missing out on a lot of these events especially the most important events like being prepared mm -hmm. uh getting ready for this day and that kind of brings me to my next point which is what it is that we're supposed to be doing to prepare Okay. Because we read over here in Malachi chapter four, down here in verse five, it talks about Elijah. Would you read that? Okay. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So before those trumpets blow, before the vials are poured out, maybe even before the earthquake, we are expecting the Elijah spirit to come and, and dwell with us. He's mm -hmm. supposed to be that angelic help that we're supposed to get. Mm -hmm. from our father it comes through elijah but look what we have to do in order to invite this elijah spirit to come and dwell with us we see that in verse four this is very important okay verse four says remember ye the law of moses my servant which i commanded unto him at Horeb for all israel with the statutes and judgments now notice over here in this common english bible instead of causing it the law it calls it what the instructions from Moses. The instructions from Moses. You know, a lot of people get hung up on that word law. Right. But if we had a better translation, mm -hmm. it would say the word instruction instead of law. Because these are the instructions for surviving the tribulation. Mm -hmm. I think when you use the word law, it makes it so legalistic that people are like, the first thing that they're saying is, I'm not required to do the law. But when you say instructions, that changes it all the way around. Yeah, you, you're actually rejecting the instructions that our father gave us for your survival. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why many of them don't expect to survive at all. They're planning on getting out of here is because, you know, they're, they're not following these instructions. Mm -hmm. But notice here that it goes into detail on what these instructions are in the King James Version, where it's talking about Mount Horeb which is where we receive the commandments, mm -hmm. the statutes, and the judgments. Right. Mm -hmm. What this is talking about is what we see over in Exodus chapter 20, 21, chapter 22, and chapter 23. It's in chapter 20 that we hear the commandments. It's in chapter 21 and in chapter 22 that we read about the judgments. And then when we come to chapter 23, we start to hear about the statutes. Right. This was given at Mount Horeb with two million people listening. You know, a prophet is somebody who's supposed to hear from our father directly. Well, this right here back there standing at Mount Horeb was the only time that two million people heard our father's voice clearly. Mm -hmm. So this is what Malachi was talking about when he said, 
in order for Elijah to come to be with us, we have to remember the law of Moses, the servant at Mount Hor with the commandments, the statutes and the judgments. Right. So in other words, that back there in Exodus was the book of the covenant. So if we want to have this Elijah spirit to come be with us before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, we're going to have to learn to live within the covenant. We're going to have to read, remember, whatever you want to say, understand the book of the covenant, which, like I said, is Exodus chapter 20 and the next three chapters all the way up to chapter 23. Exodus chapter 20 through chapter 23 is the book of the covenant. You say that we are going to have to learn to live within these things that the law, statutes and the judgments. Is this an individual thing? Absolutely. Um, everything is on an individual basis now. It's not like before mm -hmm. where he marched everybody out into the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Now we are expecting families to be broken up in this time. Right. There would be a wife or a husband in some of these families that are going to be obeying the law. And they have to be willing to let the rest of their family go away. Mm -hmm. If they're never going to embrace this law, if they're never going to do what it is they're supposed to do, that's like what we read over in uh, the New Testament, Luke and Matthew and a couple of other places. We're going to have to be willing to forsake everybody in our family. If they're not willing to obey the law, we're just going to have to let them go if we want to survive. Else we're going to go with them, you know, but that's what it means there. If you're not willing to forsake your mother, your father, your children, even your spouse, you cannot be considered one of his disciples and you will not make it over. You you will be you will be recycled with those other people. You will go away. Yeah, I think for us, you know, a little personal time. Uh, that was one of the hardest things that, you know, I think I had to hear from you is when you um, told me or when you made the decision to let me know that, hey, I'm willing to forsake you. Yeah, I'm willing to forsake these children. Yeah. And, you know, if you can't, you know, learn to live within the law, statutes and judgments, you know, you're out there by yourself. But you think of how it actually worked, though. You know, you want to get a little bit personal that, you know, there was the time when the decisions were made. You know, mm -hmm. if you guys are going to stay on the path that you are on, I'm going to go on a different route without you. Right. But look at how it turned out. Mm -hmm. You guys eventually turned around and came back and got on my path other than the other way around. If I had uh, decided that, you know what, I want my family and I'm going to come and do what you guys would expect of me to do, then we would all be lost right now. Well, yeah, that's true. But, you know, a lot of times it doesn't turn out like that. But I guess people have to be willing to, if they make that decision, to stand by it. Yeah, well, you, you don't know how it turns out until these 10 years are up right. until, you the know, earthquake comes. well, yeah, until, <laughs> yeah, until the half hour of silence is, is over, right. you, 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 your family still has a chance. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why you have to stand your ground. You can't give up. You can't give in in any way. You can't, you know, be going to their birthday parties. You can't be going, eating their, their holiday food and, you know, partaking in their, their sins and all of that stuff they want. Because if you do, like it says, you know, you will not be, one of his disciples you will go with them mm -hmm. but you know if you do i can be an example a testament that if you do hold your ground there is the chance that your family will turn around and they will come and be with you but you have to hold your ground first because if you waver they're not going to change. If they see you <laughs> flinch, if they see you blink, if they see you show any kind of doubt in what it is that you're doing, they're going to grab hold of that doubt and they're going to snatch you over to where they are and you all are going to end up in the bit, the abyss. Yeah, even to the point where you say, well, you did it the last time. They're going to absolutely <laughs> do that, you know, so you cannot give in at all. You have to be willing to, to stand up to them and you know say you know what you know if you're going to go that way then sayonara see you next lifetime you know because that's what it really boils down to it's all on an individual basis here right and i could imagine there's some in this situation that are listening very closely so it should be noted i should make this point how i didn't make any decisions for you guys right you let us um come to 
um, our own conclusion and to make our own decision. Yeah, you guys decided to leave on your own. Mm -hmm. And and when you did, I didn't come follow you or come get you or anything like that. And then eventually you guys decided to come back on your own. Right. Mm -hmm. And all I did was just stick to the word and I prayed for you every day. But I didn't waver at all as far as stepping off the path in order to save my family. And in the end, my family, I believe, was actually saved because of it. Right. It was... Um a hard transition um, for me and I think I made it harder than it should have been for the children but one of the things that um, like you said stayed the same was your willingness to not get off the path yeah. you were bound set that if I have to lose everybody you know including my parents my brothers my sister my family my wife and children I was not getting off the path. That's right. So we have to, for the sake of our families. So if you want to see your family survive, you have got to get over into the law. You have to get into the instructions, even if they won't do it with you. You know, that's why they call us forerunners. You know, that's why we are the early birds. is so that when we do have this earthquake and they are ready for this instruction, then there are those who are around who know it. The people who are learning it now will be just like Moses was, knowing the instructions so that he can lead them out into the wilderness. And that brings me to the last verse that I wanted to talk about. And that's coming from the book of Jasher, chapter 80, which tells us that Moses came back into Egypt two years before the Exodus. Mm-hmm, yeah. This is a living parable of what we're going through now. Moses was kind of like that Elijah spirit, which mm -hmm. came back into Egypt two years before the Exodus. We understand now that Elijah is to come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Well, if this pattern here holds, then we can expect Elijah to come with his people two years before the trumpets start to blow, which takes us back to where we are now. Sometime around 2022, 2023. And so how would we know that the Elijah spirit is um, within? Um, is dwelling with us? Yes, is dwelling with us. Well, he comes in a form of spiritual help from my own understanding. And, and I can't show scripture on this part. So I have to let you know that this is what I understand based on my own experiences is that things start to work for you. Your prayers start to get answered. You start to get supernatural help, start to get a lot of intuition. You start to get a lot of dreams, prophetic dreams even. Um, you start to hear from your conscious more and more. All of humanity will make this transition at one point, mm -hmm. but they're gonna have to learn to live within the law first. Because sin is what separates us from our conscience and separates us from our father. So the more we embrace the law and start to understand the law and live within the law, the more our dreams become active, the more our conscience becomes active and the more our intuition become active. And that's how we know that the Elijah spirit is with us. Plus, like I said, we gain the ability to control the elements. When, you know, people are in trouble or in a storm or whatever, we can find out that we can actually stop storms and hurricanes and all kinds of things going on. We notice that our prayers start to get answered a lot faster, even sometime before we can finish praying. Mm -hmm. we, our prayers are, are, are answered. We start to know stuff. Right. We just start to feel like our guardian angels are, are being more responsive and more active. It's still on a spiritual level. And that's why a lot of people will miss this stuff. Mm -hmm. But if you spend a lot of time praying and meditating, you will start to notice these changes and these things going on. Yeah. At least up until the point when this angel pours out this sensor on the earth and we start to get these earthquakes. Right. And it should be noted then is once this earthquake here happens, or I should say after these events that we read about in a Revelation chapter eight, that's when humanity will enter what's known as the hour of the conscious. And that's when we're all going to wake up, you know, mm -hmm. but it's and, and but the thing is, like it says here in the third testament, chapter 55 and verse 20, 29. Matter of fact, go ahead and read that. 
But the hour of the conscious approaches. It is the same as it would say that the day of the Lord or his judgment is about to take place. Then shame will arise in some and remorse in others. This is why the forerunners have to be ready when this event happens. Mm -hmm. Because when this happens, the people are going to wake up to shame and to remorse. Mm -hmm. The ones in shame, they're going to be blaming each other and, you know, talking about, you know, God did this and God did that to me. They're going to just be shameful. While those in remorse, they're going to be trying to figure out what it is that they're supposed to be doing right. Sorrowful. They're going to be sorrowful and regretful. They're going to be repentant. Right. No, that's the difference between the shame and remorse. Uh, one is blaming while the other is repenting right. well for those who are repenting they're going to be looking for these forerunners mm -hmm. to actually explain this stuff to them mm -hmm. and they're basically going to need somebody to explain the law to them mm -hmm. at least point them to exodus chapter 20 through 23 to let them know what it is that we're supposed to be doing even going as far as teaching them how to do feast days and you know how to do sabbath days and different stuff like that right and another thing that you guys could be doing to prepare is learning how the sacred calendar works. Yeah, and one of the ways that, you know, people could do that is just by purchasing a, you know, a calendar. Um, well, when, they have to do more than purchase it. They have to actually work it month to month like we have to do. And by doing so, they will learn how the celestial calendar actually works. That, again, was a hard transition for me because, you know, I was just used to looking up on the calendar, getting the time and, you know, continuing about my way. But learning the celestial calendar, you know, it just it makes more sense. It lines you up with the feast days and it'll definitely be helpful to everybody. Yep. And if you want a man-made version of it, you can go to coachingthefight.shop and get you one. I hope you guys got something out of this video in the meantime watch this whole playlist on the conscious that stacy and i did a while back yeah it's been a while ago been a while ago and but the scripture still stays mm -hmm. relevant so like i said this is a whole playlist that you guys can watch that we did verse by verse out of the third testament on the conscious and what it'll do to us what it'll feel like what it'll be like i can just say that you know you more so than I am, but we're definitely witnessing some of the stuff that we read about and taught about. Absolutely. And if you guys got anything you can testify about you witnessing, please put it in the comment section and I'll see you down there. Shalom.